I closed the door to the sound of quiet sobs behind me. She was at it again. But this time, she had gotten upset at how I got frustrated and smacked the dog when he wouldn't stop biting the furniture. Once she saw how annoyed I gotten at her, the tears started coming faster and stronger. It was already the fourth time this week this had happened, and I was becoming emotionally drained. The fault was more mine than hers, I suppose, especially looking back now. I had been raised in a household where obvious displays of emotion, especially sadness and distress, were discouraged. My parents had grown up through the war, you see. By the time they had become teenagers, both had lost their parents and buried siblings, only returned to their villages after the peace had been settled, to find that their old homes were nothing but ash and rubble. Needless to say, Two people who had gone through all that had truly little patience when I wanted to cry or be upset over something that seemed to be trivial in the end. My greatest family, on the other hand, was originally from the far east of the country, and I, of course, had sent men when the war had begun, and some of them had died. But in the end, they were never occupied like we were, they didn't have to live under the Germans' heel, or have relatives killed for the actions of far-off partitions in the forest. Not to say, of course, that they didn't struggle, just that their struggle was very, very different than ours. So, it made sense that when she was being raised, that her parents were way more lenient. I made my way down the dark staircase of our apartment building, and outside the front door into the cold and dark winter night. I took a few seconds to accustom myself to the environment, before reaching into my jacket to pull out a pack of cigarettes in my lighter. I stood in silence as I took the first few puffs of my cigarette as I started at the tall, bleak Soviet-style apartment block. Fucking ugly, isn't it? A gruff voice said behind me. I jumped a little when I heard it. I hadn't heard any footsteps in the snow approaching, but I just assumed I was too lost in my own thoughts to pay any attention. Uh, it's alright. Looks like every other building, I said back, trying to put on a disinterested tone, hoping that he would just move on and leave me alone. But instead... He came close enough that I could see his face. He wasn't a good-looking man. The years had not been kind to him from the looks of it. He had a long, thick white beard, and wrinkles ran up and down and across the entirety of his face. Despite the obvious advanced age of this man, when he walked, he did so with the vigorous confidence of someone much younger. When he was standing almost face to face with me, he gestured towards my pack of cigarettes. I reluctantly obliged and lit his cigarette once he firmly placed it in his mouth. A few puffs of the smoke escaped his mouth and made the way to my nostrils, making me wince. This used to be a half decent city, the man said. His voice still gruff, but this time tingled with the hint of regret. At that point, I noticed that he and I were not speaking the same language. They were close enough that we could understand each other, but still different. I tried to figure out what it was. Polish, maybe. No. It was far too like my language to be Polish. Belarusian. Who the hell would come to Kiev speaking only bully Russian, though? When? I asked, considering that I probably had no choice but to make conversation with this stranger. Before the war, the man gave a small shrug. It was better before the rents had to rebuild everything from scratch, for sure. 
But even 50 years ago, the city still looked like crap. At that point, I wondered how old this man was or was implying that he was. Aside from a moderately impressive center, Kiev never looked that good. Even in the old photos that I've seen, I took a deep puff of my cigarette, hoping to make it go by faster so I'd have an excuse to leave soon. When did it look so good then? The silence at that moment felt palpable and was broken once the man took a long drag of his cigarette. One thousand years ago, the city was beautiful when I walked its streets one thousand years ago. I turned and rolled my eyes. Great, I thought. I have the privilege of talking to a lunatic. Before I could mumble an excuse and head back into the building, I just kept talking. Look over there, he said, pointing a finger towards the center of the town, more specifically towards the Orient Monastery that lay there. On that hill over there, they used to have statues, large statues. One of me, a few of my brothers, and a couple of my sisters. He went on to talk about how the ancestors of the people who lived in this city used to bring offerings to these statues. Breads, fruits, sweets, honey, cloths. All the while I was trying to figure out exactly what was wrong with him. He wasn't slurring his words, so I didn't think he was drunk. Maybe he was just insane. Regardless though, I didn't leave him. My cigarette had long gone out and I had stamped what was left of it on the ground, next to countless other cigarette butts. But there I stood, still listening to this clearly ridiculous man going on and on. So who are you then? I asked, cutting him off. Who are you to know all of this? I said. I had no intention of humoring him though. Perhaps I was looking for any way to procrastinate on heading back up to the apartment to see my wife still in tears. The man smiled to show his rotten teeth. I call me Veles, the man said with a tone of pride in his voice. My statue stood there, next to my brothers Brun and Rai, and my sister Morana. He continued, while pointing in the direction of the monastery again. And I was worshipped across all this land and others. Before four men in long black clothes came to me these shores to steal my people away from me, the mood changed at that point. Even though the man was clearly elated and smiling, the darkness that was around us suddenly felt heavier. At that point, I had started walking back towards the door of my apartment building. As I opened the door, I turned back over my shoulder. I was still standing there. If you were a god, I started. Then make my wife stop crying. Being sarcastic was a trait of mine since as long as I could remember. Immediately after saying that, I had felt guilty. I felt the guilt of not being able to be the support that my wife desperately needed. And I also felt guilty about being an ass to this man who was obviously not well. But the man simply smiled. Give me an offering, and I'll deliver. Playing along, I walked back towards him, and offered him another cigarette from my pack. Once I had lit it for him, he gave me a smirk, followed by a nod, and walked away. I walked up the stairs of our apartment building, thinking about how I would apologize to my wife, how I would do better, how I would always be there for her. If Alice was right, my wife has not cried since. Instead, I've been the one crying. I've cried nearly every night since the next day after I met Felix. When we had to lower my sweet margarita's casket into the ground, 
the mind is particularly amazing at denying the truth, especially when it may be staring one directly in the face. I had convinced myself that everything that had happened was a coincidence, that my wife had an undiagnosed condition that had killed her. It was only decades later though, right after the fall of communism, when we could attend church services once again, that I had the realization. As I stood in the same monastery, that men had pointed at all those years ago, I recognized the same language that he was speaking in. It was the same language that the priest was chanting in. It was an older, ancient form of Slavic languages that we all spoke. It was the language that the people of this land spoke 1,000 years ago.